to your own time in school and how many things actually occurred off of the campus of the school, whether it was college, secondary education, or anything. Off-campus assaults or online harassment wreak just as much havoc on a student's education as on-campus assaults. It does not require schools to timely resolve reports of sexual harassment or violence. Permitting schools to resolve complaints concerning sexual assault through mediation. During my career, I have litigated a significant number of cases involving sexual violence and intimate partner violence in family court in New York. I have never recommended that one of my clients in those situations utilize mediation. Eliminating the caution against schools relying on criminal investigations as a substitute for their own independent investigations and determinations. Eliminating the prohibition on permitting a respondent to question a survivor's sexual history. Eliminating the requirement that schools provide appellate rights to both parties, if provided at all, and instead allowing schools to provide appellate rights to only the alleged perpetrator. Eliminating the strong discouragement to schools from permitting alleged perpetrators to directly cross-examine complainants. As a former prosecutor, I understand the importance of cross-examination, but there are ways to limit re-traumatization and re-victimization to survivors of sexual harassment or assault. In closing, I urge this commission to look at how the September 2017 Title IX policy changes weaken Title IX enforcement and fails to protect survivors' civil right to access their education. Additionally, in the, new in the near future, the current administration's new rules will be unveiled, and I seek this commission to seek input about the impact of the proposed rule. Thank you. Thank you. I thought speaker. Good afternoon. My name is Nicole Dooley, and I work as policy counsel at the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. Since its founding in 1940, LDF has used litigation, policy advocacy, public education, and community organizing strategies to achieve racial justice and equity in the areas of education, economic justice, political participation, and criminal justice. We will submit more extensive written comments after today's hearing, but I want to give a brief overview of the effect that the current administration's attack on civil rights has had on communities of color. The administration is making a concerted effort to dismantle diversity efforts from K through college by withdrawing guidance on the voluntary use of race to achieve diversity in schools and supporting a lawsuit challenging the consideration of race in college admissions. The administration seemingly plans to withdraw guidance advising schools and districts on the non-discriminatory administration of school discipline, a move that would be inconsistent with the Department of Education's own findings that decades-old racial disparities in school discipline persist. And the department has delayed implementation of significant disproportionality regulations, abdicating its responsibility to protect students from widespread and well-documented race-based disparities in the identification, placement, and discipline of students with disabilities. HUD uh, has sought to begin several roles aimed at ending discrimination and segregation in housing. One provides jurisdictions with a roadmap and tools for compliance with the Fair Housing Act and included measures for accountability. A second, which was reinstated after a successful legal challenge to HUD's proposed suspension, aims to give families the purchasing power to move to higher opportunity neighborhoods instead of being confined to segregated and impoverished ones by improving the way that the value of housing vouchers is calculated. The Department of Justice has become this, administ this administration's voter suppression agency, siding with Texas in an effort to impose a discriminatory photo ID scheme and with Ohio in an effort to unfairly purge voters. The administration created a so-called Voter Integrity Commission, since disbanded after substantial resistance, to manufacture a record of voter fraud to both vindicate the president's false claims of voter fraud and to create an excuse to suppress the votes of Black and Latinx voters. The Department of Justice is also working to reverse years of advances in criminal justice. It has, for example, reinstated the long discredited policy of harshly punishing individuals who commit low level nonviolent drug offenses and is trying to undermine consent decrees aimed at policing reform, even those to which DOJ is not a party. These actions are not exhaustive, but illustrative of the broad attack this administration has undertaken against all civil rights. We ask this commission to continue its mission of enhancing enforcement of federal civil rights through robust and independent fact-finding. Thank you. Thank you.
Good afternoon, Commissioners. My name is Amna Farati. I serve as Senior Director of Government Relations and Policy for the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum. For over 32 years, we at the Health Forum have sought to improve the health and well-being of the 23 million and rising Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. We work to advance health access and protect civil rights and health care for communities who are 60% immigrant and 30% limited English proficient. For my testimony today, I will focus on the intersection of health and civil rights. Concerns about enforcement of civil rights are nothing new. However, they are substantially heightened under the current Trump administration. In particular, we must understand the complex chilling effect the administration is having with respect to individual civil rights and access to programs that they are legally entitled to. At the Health Forum, we work with over 150 partners in 28 states, and we have heard a number of stories that show the continuing lack of language access protected by federal civil rights laws for patients. For example, we heard a story from a young woman in, originally from Indonesia who now calls Pennsylvania home. She, is a, she has a T visa. She has a T visa because she survived human trafficking for over 10 years. Despite her experiences, she now has health care through Medicaid, something she should be able to rely on with strong federal civil rights protections. However, even when she is able to access an interpreter using a language line at the doctor's office, her care is of lower quality than those who are English speakers. She has often not provided written instructions for follow-up and other critical information. This threatens her health and undermines the quality of her care. We have also worked with advocates nationwide over the past several years to enroll 1 million Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders in 50 languages in Affordable Care Act, Medicaid, and Children's Health Insurance pr Program coverage. We have heard numerous stories from assisters and patients that language access continues to be a consistent barrier to getting health insurance and actually using it. People have often never understood, uh, limited English proficient people rather, often have never understood when they have received legally required notices in the mail that impact their eligibility and enrollment and ability to see a doctor. This is because the notices are only sent in English and Spanish. They are not sent in Asian and Pacific Islander languages. This context now is far more difficult as AAPIs and other immigrants are afraid to enroll in services and access them given the chilling impact this administration's immigration and other actions targeting civil rights are having as a result of the proposed public charge regulation. There are serious questions as well about how this administration is enforcing federal civil rights protections when it leaks proposals that seek to undermine or otherwise eliminate civil rights. These are just some of the examples that we wanted to provide the commission. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair and Commissioners. My name is Candace Gibson. I'm a staff attorney with the National Health Law Program. Founded nearly 50 years ago, the National Health Law Program protects and advances the health rights of low-income and underserved individuals and families. We advocate, educate, and litigate at the federal and state levels. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comments today. We are deeply troubled by the current administration's actions to undermine access to health care for low-income individuals and communities who already struggle to access care, particularly those who are from communities of color, including women of color, people living with disabilities, and LGBTQ individuals, and the federal protections they rely on to access care. As one example, the Trump administration has encouraged states to impose additional barriers to Medicaid coverage, including requiring individuals to work or complete work-related activities to maintain their coverage. The administration has also allowed states to impose premiums on individuals with very low or no incomes and to punish individuals who do not pay their premiums by terminating their coverage and locking them out of Medicaid for up to six months. Not only are these, not only are these actions illegal, but they are troubling. Low-income people rely on Medicaid. People like Charles Gresham in Arkansas, who has several serious health conditions, including asthma, social anxiety, and a seizure disorder. Medicaid coverage has allowed him to get the treatment and services he needs. Work, work requirements antithetical to Medicaid's mission of providing medical assistance to eligible individuals threaten his ability to maintain Medicaid coverage and to stay healthy. In the past two months, over 8,000 Arkansans have already lost their Medicaid coverage due to these requirements. Further, this administration has approved similar draconian policies in other states. As of yesterday, the Department of Health and Human Services approved Wisconsin's waiver package. 
In addition, we are concerned that the Office for Civil Rights at the Department of Health and Human Services lacks the leadership and resources needed to enforce federal civil rights protections. In January of this year, the Office for Civil Rights established a new division, the Conscience and Religious Freedom Division. The division will have the authority to investigate and enforce federal refusal laws that allow providers to opt out providing the standard of care and reproductive health services. We are concerned that this division will take away needed resources from the enforcement of federal protections, such as Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act, also known as the Health Care Rights Law, which bans discrimination in health care, Title VI, and the Rehabilitation Act. We are also troubled by the administration's proposed changes to undermine the health care rights law. Combined, these efforts will decrease access to coverage and care for individuals who already struggle to obtain the care they need. The National Health Law Program will continue to protect the civil rights of Medicaid participants across the country so they can maintain their access to health care free of discrimination. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. <clears throat> I'm Mara Keesling, the Executive Director of the National Center for Transgender transgender equality advocating on behalf of two million transgender people in the U.S. We are your neighbors, co-workers, and family members. And while we have made crucial and historic strides in visibility, too many of us still face widespread disrespect, discrimination, and violence. In a survey we conducted of 28,000 transgender adults, we found that one in three lives in poverty, one in eight has been homeless in just the past year, and one third of those who saw a doctor were turned away or mistreated. According to another study, nearly nine in 10 transgender students face routine harassment in school. Such mistreatment touches every community. Earlier this year, a school in Oklahoma was shut down for two days when a group of parents made violent online threats against a 12-year-old transgender girl named Maddie. On her first day of seventh grade, she was told to use the staff bathroom, but hadn't yet been told where it was. So naturally, she used the girls' room. The threat started immediately, and the family was forced to move away. This extreme case illustrates the climate of fear endured by trans children and adults and fostered by this administration. The Trump administration has waged a constant campaign against the civil rights of trans people, including students like Maddie. The administration has rolled back life-saving guidance that was specifically requested by the nation's educators and child care experts to help them understand protections for trans students. The Department of Education is also reportedly now just throwing out complaints from transgender students. They have taken the same approach to protections in employment and health care law. And last week, we learned that officials are pushing a coordinated strategy to deny the very existence of transgender people and erase us from federal law, requiring us to endure genetic testing before exercising our rights. Trans people in our families are increasingly and understandably scared and angry because of these lawless attacks from the administration. The president denigrates and attacks anyone he can paint as different or other, using lies, fear, and dangerous policies that put lives at risk. He has targeted asylum seekers, Muslims, survivors of sexual violence, people of color, women, and yes, transgender people. The administration has refused to enforce or even follow the law, ignoring binding appeals court precedents. At the same time, it has seized on outlier rulings from a single district court to justify its attacks. They have ignored the voices of the medical community that recognize that trans people are real and that we should be respected for who we are. They have brushed off thoughtful, fact-based policies and court precedent with vague sweeping memos, or as was the case for transgender service members, mere thoughtless tweets. Despite all this, transgender people are incredibly resilient. Every trans person I know has lost something, and yet we continue to live as we are, knowing that the power of our truth is more valuable than a life in hiding. Though the harm is already the, though the harm already done is inescapable, it is not irreparable. The federal government has a unique role in protecting the civil rights of every person in this country, including us. I urge the commission to stand with the courts and stand with the people in resisting this administration's efforts to permanently harm us and tell the administration that our civil rights won't be erased and transgender people won't be erased. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry about my cold. <laughs> Sorry for you. <laughs> my name is Amy Adams. I'm from Stafford County, Virginia, and I am the proud mother of three children. My middle child, Morgan, is a transgender girl. That means that while she may have been designated male at birth, she has consistently identified as female for as long as she can remember. Morgan transitioned four years ago at 10 when she stopped living life as a boy and started living as her true self. She has many friends and family members who support her, as well as teachers and administrators at her public school who are on her side. Morgan is a wonderful, amazing, beautiful young woman. 
but because Morgan is transgender, I can't count on all of the adults in her life to be on her side. I was forced to confront this sad fact early last month when Morgan's school had a lockdown drill to simulate an active shooter situation. My daughter was in gym class during the safety drill and teachers were supposed to bring Morgan and her fellow students into the locker rooms until the safety drill was over. Most of the students were quickly taken into the locker rooms, but my daughter was not. Instead, Morgan's teachers debated whether my daughter should go into the boys' locker room or the girls. This was a result of the school's decision to exclude Morgan from using the girls' restrooms or locker rooms. This drill was supposed to be about safety, student safety, my daughter's safety. Morgan's teachers ultimately sent her to sit in the hallway between the locker rooms. I want to repeat that. During a safety drill designed to protect Morgan and her fellow students in case of danger, my daughter was considered such a threat to her peers that she was left exposed and defenseless. I don't blame my daughter's teachers. They weren't trained on how to work with transgender students. Unfortunately, since this incident happened, the school has been working to better support Morgan. But not all transgender students are lucky enough to attend schools that can learn from their mistakes. This administration and Secretary DeVos's Department of Education have only made things worse for transgender youth by withdrawing the Obama administration's critical guidance on supporting transgender students in schools. Adults, especially those working in schools, are expected to protect young people. This was not protection. This was the opposite of protection, actually putting my daughter in more danger. <coughs> like any parent, I want to protect my children. Like any parent, I want my children to learn and grow and thrive at school. Unlike many parents, though, I am forced to watch as my daughter's civil rights are ignored and cast aside. My daughter Morgan is 14. She wants to be a makeup artist when she's older. She is beautiful and hilarious and the strongest person I know. She's known as a leader at her school, always getting good grades and eager to help her peers. Her peers love her and support her completely, and the education system failed her. The federal government failed her, just like it is failing transgender young people in schools across this country. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Erica Moritsuku. I'm here on behalf of the Anti-Defamation League. Madam Chair and Commissioners, thank you for holding this briefing. Over the years, the Commission has done trailblazing work on so many core issues for ADL, including hate crime response, campus anti-Semitism, civil rights, LGBTQ equality, and religious freedom. We've been honored to work in partnership with the Commission on these and other issues. I'd like to use my time to try to elevate two issues for the Commission. First, ADL has been a leader in promoting effective response to hate crimes. In the aftermath of the murder of 11 Jews in their synagogue in Pittsburgh last Shabbat, the single worst incident of anti-Semitism in US history, we wanted to emphasize that the Department of Justice and the FBI have done very good work in enforcing federal hate crime laws and in investigating a wide range of hate crimes in America, including several involving victims targeted for no other reason than their gender, gender identity. But the best way to address hate crimes is to address hate. The ADL has long argued that America's leaders must use their bully pulpits to call out hate. The language that our leaders use and the issues they prioritize affect how we treat one another, just like the laws they pass and implement. And on this, the administration has to date fallen short of what we have come to expect and what this nation needs. The federal government cannot effectively address hate crimes if it is at the same time scapegoating Muslims, denigrating Hispanics, demonizing refugees and other marginalized communities through their words and actions, through policy and executive actions, promoting regulatory changes and filing briefs that negatively impact the LGBTQ communities, especially the transgender community. Second, the administration has repeatedly spoken about the importance of religious freedom but it is promoting an unrecognizable redefinition of religious freedom, one in which the notion of religious liberty is no longer a shield to protect individual and institutional religious freedom, but instead is a sword designed to thwart anti-discrimination laws protecting women, LGBTQ equality, and religious minorities. In the name of religious freedom, we have seen this administration promote government-funded employment discrimination, restrict access to health services, and attempt to restrict the rights of transgender Americans in the military, in public schools, in the workplace, and in prisons. Again, we are very grateful that the Commission is examining these and other issues today. ADL intends to file more complete comments for your consideration in the coming weeks. Thank you. Thanks very much. 
Members of the Commission, thank you for the opportunity to comment today. My name is Peter Kai, and I am a Law and Policy Associate at the Poverty and Race Research Action Council, a national civil rights policy organization based here in Washington, D.C. We are working to ensure that there is robust fair housing enforcement and oversight, and are greatly concerned about the current direction of federal fair housing policy. First, we are deeply concerned about potential changes to the 2015 Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Rule. The AFFH rule established a valuable oversight mechanism and planning framework to help HUD grantees meet their statutory duty to take proactive steps to dismantle entrenched patterns of segregation, discrimination, and disinvestment. This rule has already benefited many communities around the country. Unfortunately, the, suspe the suspension of this rule in January and HUD's intent to revise it undermined this critically important tool for advancing fair housing. While the rule is sus suspended, there is little HUD oversight of fair housing planning. Keeping the rule intact and restoring its implementation is critically important to achieving the aims of the Fair Housing Act. HUD's stated intent to revisit its disparate impact rule is also troubling. This regulation formalized a long-held interpretation by HUD and courts that disparate impact claims may be brought under the Fair Housing Act. Disparate impact liability is essential to fair housing enforcement. Without it, there would be major obstacles to attacking subtle but pervasive housing-related discrimination, as well as implicit structural biases in the housing market. Revising the rule could unduly weaken the definition of discriminatory effect, the burden-shifting framework, and more, making it more difficult to address the discriminatory effects of housing practices and the reinforcement of segregation. We urge HUD to leave the rule intact. We are also concerned about inadequate staffing and funding of HUD's Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity. FHEO staff play a vital role in enforcing the Fair Housing Act, providing guidance, and ensuring that housing and community development programs are administered in a way that promotes diverse, inclusive communities. Despite the critical importance of FHEO, it has been chronically underfunded and staffing levels continue to decline, severely limiting the ability of the federal government to effectively enforce fair housing protections. We call for a robust funding of FHEO and increased staffing so that the office can have the resources and capacity it needs. Finally, there is a need to address the role of federal housing programs in perpetuating and exacerbating racial and economic segregation in the United States. For example, many aspects of the administration of the Housing Choice Voucher Program prevent voucher holders from exercising true housing choice. As a result, voucher holders are disproportionately concentrated in poor and racially segregated neighborhoods that lack quality schools, jobs, and other opportunities. The consequences of this type of segregation are devastating and contribute to wide racial disparities in education, health, and other areas. More must be done to ensure that deciding of affordable housing is balanced and that residents have true housing choice. We urge the Commission to carefully examine the enforcement of fair housing protections. Thank you. Thanks very much. Next speaker. Madam Chair and members of the Commission, my name is Jess Davidson and I'm the Executive Director of End Rape on Campus, a national nonprofit organization that seeks to end a world free from sexual violence in education through direct support for survivors and their families, prevention education, and policy reform. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm also a survivor of campus sexual assault who is dependent on the civil rights afforded to me under Title IX. I know that I'm not alone. Three million college students will be sexually assaulted this fall. This is unacceptable and it isn't even the entire story. Sexual assault in education isn't just about college campuses like that on which my, my organization focuses, but also future leaders like students in elementary school. Approximately 40 to 60% of black girls report coercive sexual contact before they turn 18, and 78% of transgender or gender non-conforming children are sexually harassed in grades K through 12. There are civil rights protections put in place to protect students, and yet this administration is determined to rip those rights away. Civil rights violations do not happen in a vacuum. As human beings, we live at intersections. At Iraq, we believe passionately that Title IX's strict enforcement, including with its intersections with other civil rights laws, is the federal government's moral and legal imperative. Title II should be built for survivors. A student's history of depression or anxiety or other disability should not be used to discredit their report of sexual violence. Title VI should also be built for survivors. Race, color, and national origin should never be grounds to discredit survivors of sexual assault in classrooms, in the workplace, or online. Experienced advocates have looked on in horror as this administration has staged an intentional attack on civil rights protections for students, particularly students of color, students with disabilities, and transgender and gender nonconforming students. To attack those students is to attack survivors. 
students with disabilities experience assault at two times the rate of students without disabilities. And nearly one in four transgender, gender queer, or gender non-conforming students experience sexual violence during their undergraduate education. Meanwhile, this administration is not seeking to protect those students further, but doing everything it can to erase civil rights for these very students. But these violations, this violence, is not a foregone conclusion. I'm here today to respectfully request that this commission investigates the Department of Education's recent and impending decision making on rescinding previous guidance on Title IX enforcement and replacing it with a dangerous regulation that will chill reporting and prevent students everywhere from being able to access their civil rights under Title IX, including an egregious lack of survivor inclusion in the stakeholder engagement process, to which my organization can further attest, and a policy decision making process that is based on rape myths and false sex stereotypes. Ensuring Title IX and its sister civil rights laws, Title II, Title VI, and Title VII are protected is a civil rights issue and a human rights issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to address this committee. My name is Michelle Carroll, and I'm the current Associate Director of External Programs uh, with, the, with Anne Rape on Campus. And prior to joining EROC, I was the Director of Campus Projects with the New York State Coalition Against Sexual Assault. I am here to speak to you about the importance of the government's leadership and enforcement of Title IX, Title II, and Title VI, and how these civil rights protections can be the difference between a student finishing their education and a student dropping out due to discrimination and or violence. It is the government's role to ensure that all students are safe during their educations, including our K through 12 college students and grad scholars. This role is referenced in numerous dear colleague letters from the Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights, including the 2001, 2010 and 2011 dear colleague letters. This expectation has been taken seriously by previous administrations and the government's leadership on preventing and addressing gender and race discrimination has successfully signaled to communities, K through 12 schools and our colleges, the seriousness of the short term and long term effects of gender, sex and race discrimination. 31% of college students will drop out after experiencing sex discrimination and or sexual violence. That percentage is higher for vulnerable student populations. Additionally, a single instance of sexual violence can cost upwards of $200,000 for medical, uh, medical costs, mental health costs, student fees, etc. Consider the lifetime costs of victimization for students who are assaulted in middle school or elementary school. And as we continue to move into the new age of social media, the government must continue to provide leadership on the importance of online harassment and how these instances of harassment can rise to the level of gender, sex, and race discrimination, thus following a student from their desk at home to their homeroom classroom. The government's leadership on these issues, as evidenced by federal guidance, and its role as an accountability measure has enabled community organizations to confidently offer their expertise to schools and colleges, thus building local collaborative decision-making bodies dedicated to combining the community's medical, mental health, and criminal justice services available to help students stay in school after experience discrimination. In my previous role with the New York State Coalition, I witnessed how over 200 colleges have partnered with their local rape crisis programs to provide prevention training and direct services to students. Additionally, New York has seen a rise in the development of sexual assault response teams and college consortiums that meet to discuss their community's resources and how best to ensure that students have access to all the community can offer. In the 2011 Dear Colleague letter, the government recognized how education is the great equalizer and that the government's role in preventing and addressing harassment is a key function of its preservation of student rights. This committee has an incredible role in preserving our students' rights to an education, uh, and I commend the committee for the work so far. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Chair, Madam Chair, and members of the commission. It is an honor to testify today before the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights on the important topic of federal civil rights enforcement. My name is Tony Michelle Jackson. I am a, a deputy attorney general in the office of the attorney general for the district of columbia our office is charged with conducting the law business of the district and with protecting the public interest in that vein um, we have worked very hard over the last four years <clears throat> to develop a pub public interest litigation practice that is responsive to the needs of our residents i want to highlight while there are many i want to highlight two today um, two key areas in which the lack of federal enforcement or the rollbacks in enforcement are having an outsized effect on district residents. 
first, a, press a pressing issue for district residents is housing. And housing discrimination in particular is a barrier to opportunity. Among other documented discrimination in the housing market, the Center for Investigative Reporting has uncovered racial disparities in mortgage lending in the district. But to assess potential claims, we need, among other things, detailed information about credit scores, loan to value ratios, and debt to income ratios. Under the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, the S Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has the power and indeed previously promulgated regulations to require that kind of detailed reporting from banks, which our office could have used to enforce local and federal protections against housing discrimination. But under Mick Mulvaney, the CFPV backed a law that exempts 85% of banks and almost 50% of other mortgage lenders from providing this comprehensive information. The failure to require detailed reporting limits the federal government's ability to uncover disparities in mortgage lending based on race and national origin, and it impedes the ability of the district to ensure that mortgage lending is fair. The abdication of the federal government's information forcing function is not unique. Second, the administration's pushed to redefine sex in civil rights laws in, to include only bio, biological sex threatens the district's already marginalized transgender community. A 2015 study of district employee, employers showed that almost half would prefer to hire a less qualified cisgender person than a more qualified transgender applicant. Moreover, hate crimes are on the rise in the district. The, they nearly tripled between 2015 and 2017. And one of the biggest increases we are currently seeing is in, is in crimes based on gender identity. Thankfully, the district has the Human Rights Act, um, but the federal government's resources are not com comparable uh, to what the district has, and we need greater and more strategic enforcement on the federal level to ensure that our residents are fully protected. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Next speaker. Madam Chair, Commissioners, uh, staff, Certainly appreciate the opportunity to testify before the uh, the commission. Um, I'm Edward A. Hales Jr. I'm a managing director and general counsel for Advancement Project, a national civil rights and racial justice action tank that works on the ground in support of local organizing, informed by careful legal reasoning and strategic communications. Uh, we're engaged in a uh, thousand points of fight around the, uh, the country where effective uh, federal civil rights enforcement would be helpful. I uh, just want to lift up one particular uh, concern today and supplement uh, this statement with uh, additional Thank information you. before your stated uh, deadline. Um, Advancement Project is nearly 20 years old. And right after we uh, were, were founded, uh, we co-authored a, uh, a report. It was a groundbreaking report with the Harvard Civil Rights project entitled Opportunities Suspended. Uh, this document identified and named the school to prison pipeline, the policies and practices that push children out of school and on a pathway to prison and outlined its harmful effects uh, specifically upon black and brown children, students with disabilities and other groups of marginalized uh, children. And in nearly 20 years of our existence, we have worked with various community partners across the country to dismantle the egregious civil rights violation known as the school to prison pipeline. In July 2016, Advancement Project, along with our partner, uh, DeSoto County Parents and Students for Justice, uh, filed a new supporting letter documenting uh, the continuation of discriminatory discipline practices in DeSoto County, uh, which is a school district in Hernando, M Mississippi. The letter supplemented um, information sent to the U.S. Department of Education and came months after the department opened a formal investigation in response to a complaint filed on behalf of students and parents in 2015. Uh, it, it, the, the letter pointed out the major instances in which the discriminatory uh, discipline policy impacted black students there 
And what we have learned more recently, uh, according to the U.S. Department of Education's uh, Office for Civil Rights website, as of September 30th, 2018, there are 1,556 pending Title VI cases currently under investigation at elementary, secondary, and post-secondary school, secondary schools. There are 328 discipline cases. In March 2018, the U.S. Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights issued a revised case processing manual designed to, quote unquote, help the office better manage its docket, investigations, and resolution. A particular provision in that statement now has resulted in over 500 disability rights complaints leading, being dismissed, leading to concerns that more effective oversight and federal guidance is needed. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Liz King and I am the director of the education program at the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights in Washington, D.C., a coalition charged by our diverse membership of more than 200 national organizations to promote and protect the civil and human rights of all persons in the United States. I appreciate the Commission's willingness to hear from the public on this critically important topic. Issues of civil rights enforcement are not simply interesting legal puzzles or fodder for academic debates. This is about the actual lived experiences of children in our nation's schools every day. This commission has the responsibility to ensure that federal civil rights laws and federal civil rights enforcement are meaningfully ensuring equal opportunity for students and preventing the discrimination that limits the potential of children of color, children with disabilities, girls, students who are LGBTQ, Native American, immigrants, religious minorities, or English learners. It is critically important that the Commission understand the need for continued federal enforcement where areas of federal law and the U.S. Constitution are concerned. While children are dependent on the educators and other adults around them every day for their safety and fair treatment, it is irresponsible and inconsistent with the laws themselves to suggest that these federal obligations can be fulfilled by state and local leaders alone. The civil rights community and the marginalized people we represent have learned over and over and over again that without necessary intervention from federal civil rights enforcement agencies, rights are undermined and opportunities are lost. What we have seen from the U.S. Department of Education over the past 22 months is a failure to execute the legal and moral responsibility of the agency. The rescission of the transgender student guidance, the rescission of the sexual assault guidance, the changes to the case processing manual, the limitations on considering data in the context of investigations, the rescission of guidance on diversity at the K-12 and higher education levels, the delay of the significant disproportionality rule, and other actions both public and hidden have demonstrated that Secretary DeVos and the department she leads are unwilling or unable to fulfill their responsibility to protect students from discrimination and enforce federal law. The commission must take note and take action on behalf of our children and our laws. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Linda Garcia, and I am the Policing Campaign Director at the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Prior to this role, I served as a trial attorney in the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division, where my work focused on pattern and practice investigations of police departments and the enforcement of consent decrees. Today, the Commission asked whether the federal government is meeting its obligation to, enforce, to vindicate and protect civil rights. In the context of addressing systemic police misconduct, the answer is no. As part of any pattern or practice investigation, investigators speak with hundreds of community members and police officers. During my time at the Department of Justice, I heard from community members who would tell stories of being slammed against a wall and searched just when walking home from work or to the corner store to buy milk. I would hear that police used excessive force from applying handcuffs too tightly just to cause pain to tasering children in schools for minor misbehaviors. And I listened to mothers, to mothers who told their stories of identifying their children's bodies after they had been shot and killed by a police officer. Excuse me. I also listened to officers, and they shared stories of working within a system where their performance is measured by metrics that incentivize stopping, searching, and arresting people, many times without regard to civil rights. They spoke of broken accountability systems that do little to address officer misconduct, thereby delegitimizing those officers who go to work every day to try and help the communities that they serve. 
The consent decrees that the Department of Justice negotiates to fix these sorts of problems, like the ones in New Orleans, Ferguson, and Baltimore, promote sustainable, constitutional, and effective policing by reforming the policies, practices, training, and accountability systems in police departments. They give communities a meaningful voice in the process and in developing uh, the policies and practices for the de their police departments. When communities view police and the process as legitimate, they start to work with police departments and cooperate with them to address serious crime, thereby improving public safety. The current administration is, for lack of a better word, hostile to, towards this work. Attorney General Sessions has stated that, quote, it is not the responsibility of the federal government to manage non-federal law enforcement, unquote. Yet, the department has tried to stand in the way of police reform at the local level as well, most recently by urging a federal court not to enter a consent decree that was negotiated between the Illinois Attorney General and the city of Chicago. This work is under threat, and without pattern or practice investigations, communities across the country will continue to be impacted by police misconduct while the federal government abdicates its duty to address this injustice, which warrants the oversight of this commission. Thank you. Thanks very much. Good evening. Um, thank you to the commission for having this opportunity for all of us to um, testify. My name is Jorge Andres Soto and I'm with the National Fair Housing Alliance. I'm director of public policy there. The National Fair Housing Alliance is a national civil rights organization dedicated to ending housing discrimination and made up of local nonprofit fair housing organizations uh, that do intakes and investigations of victims of discrimination in their own communities. Um, 50 years after the Fair Housing Act made housing discrimination illegal, acts of housing discrimination still occur every day. And while often these go undetected and underreported, housing discrimination is still a huge obstacle for many. The importance of private enforcement of the Federal Fair Housing Act cannot be overstated for this and many other reasons. Every year, NAFA collects, and that's her short name, um, NAFA collects data from both private fair housing organizations and government agencies across the country that receive and address fair housing complaints from the public. In 2017, there were over 2,800, 2800 I'm sorry, 28 thousand reported complaints of housing discrimination across the country. 71 percent of those were addressed by private nonprofit fair housing groups uh, as compared to complaints processed by HUD, local and state fair housing agencies and the Department of Justice. Increasingly, acts of discrimination are taking on more subtle forms and while overt housing discrimination still occurs, it is masked by housing providers offering false information, quoting different prices, providing an inferior product or amenities, or applying different standards of qualification criteria. Without private enforcement that utilizes testing investigation tools, subtle discrimination would permeate rental, sales, lending, and insurance markets to a greater degree and relatively unchecked. Um, in terms of HUD's administrative challenges when enforcing the Fair Housing Act, its enforcement regularly exceeds the 100-day 100, 100 deadline set forth in its own regulations for each complaint that's submitted to HUD. Indeed, HUD has decreased its average complaint investigation time, and we commend it for that. However, this trend must, continue, trend must continue in order to ensure that victims have faith that HUD will resolve their issues and not be done so in a way that pushes legitimate complaints to the side uh, for the purpose of expediency. HUD also lacks the effective oversight of state, fair housing, uh, of state fair housing assistance program participants, which it relies upon to work through its caseload. By statute, HUD is authorized to refer complaints it receives to state and local civil rights agencies that enforce a substantively equivalent fair housing law to the Fair Housing Act, the Federal Fair Housing Act. Mm -hmm. However, investigation protocols and cause determination policies often widely vary partici uh, across participating agencies and can conflict with the standards set forth by the Fair Housing Act itself. HUD also has undermined the work of private fair housing organizations through its failure to effectively administer the, the, fair, the, the fair Housing Initiatives Program, which provides grants to pro private nonprofit fair housing organizations to investigate complaints and educate the marketplace about fair housing laws. For the last several years, HUD has delayed the release of the Notice of Funding Availability for this program and has derailed three-year enforcement grants, which require reapplication each year. The result has been dozens of private nonprofit fair housing organizations temporarily ceasing operations of their services and actually letting go experienced staff as a result of all of these mismanagement um, mismanagements. To address these issues, HUD must request additional resources for fair housing enforcement staff from Congress, conduct an independent oversight audit of the Fair Housing Assistance Program, and revise existing regulations to ensure HUD hands over HUD, complaints that HUD hands over to state and local agencies are appropriately adjudicated and that I need to stop you. I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Uh, good afternoon. My name is Li Yang Tang, uh, Commissioner, who is still here okay, to hear my message. And I think that's very important. And I've been here since this morning, 8.30. So uh, you got to know how important your job is. And I want to go back to this, uh, this morning, you know, all the message you talk about is real data analysis. You ask how do they want to help you, and I would rather that you know that data and analysis so far are incorrect. Fake, fake information is always there by, by all the agencies, by all their staff, by all the police. So you got to know if this is give you a false message, your remedy will be wrong. So I hope you go back to really search the data and then really examine the information, whether it's correct or not. Not just an agency or lower court or lower government agency give it to the maybe Census Bureau or something. There's no called data. It's true. But you have to go back whether the data used is correct or not. A lot of education funding or social program funding, they are not do their purpose. They are not for education purpose. They are not for free lunch purpose. They are not for social security benefit for elderly or for somebody. Or if you say the jail, that's not for public safety purpose. So you must go back to see whether they are doing wrong or let send people to the jail just to give them deprivation of their sleeping or their food. And that's called torture and murdering. So we know all this society is very bad, and the most important now is the police and the Department of Justice. They are doing all the wrong job. They are real negative productivity, negative. So you are not trying to think employment is unemployment lower is good. It's just a negative. It's getting worse. So you have to think about all this related. So this importance for your children, for your sibling, for your elderly. And I see a lot of time the elderly are separated. They are the lovely couple, they are separated. They send them to a different kind of rehab or nursing home and they don't give a food. Instead, they may be forced injection and murder them. Because I know my family have just experience. So I just saw, especially now, you know, it's PPP, public-private partnership. There's a propaganda everywhere from the local to federal to global, and then they, including educational or non-profit organization. So this hurt our society a lot. You got to examine those. And I will submit my testimony and give you more detail later. Thank you very much. Thanks. Please read carefully. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen of the commission, I'm Mark Herring, the Attorney General of Virginia, here tonight on behalf of the people of Virginia, as well as several fellow state attorneys general who intend to submit supplemental written comments. It's a particular honor for me to address this body because my great uncle, Robert S. Rankin, served on this commission from 1960 to 1976, and the commission's library bears his name. Over the last several decades, individual Americans and state governments have been able to rely on the federal government as a partner in the shared mission to secure and vindicate civil rights. Sadly, it seems this reliance and expectation is no longer well-founded, and this relationship is fracturing. One of President Trump's first executive orders attempted to enact a Muslim ban that violated the constitutional rights of many living in our nation and raised fear among American Muslims and other minority communities that they could find themselves the next target of government-sanctioned and mandated discrimination. These fears have proven well-founded, as we have witnessed further efforts to undermine cherished civil rights, including deeply troubling talk in recent days about executive orders to nullify the 14th Amendment and birthright citizenship. The Department of Education under Secretary Betsy DeVos is trying to undo years of progress led by Chairwoman Lehman and others to combat sexual violence on college campuses and ensure the right to pursue an education in a safe and equal in environment. The CFPB and HUD have reversed or rolled back rules and regulations that ensure minorities are not subjected to unconstitutional discrimination when trying to secure housing or loans. And this administration is currently presiding over one of the most frightening surges in anti-Semitism and white supremacist violence in recent memory. 
-hmm. and where the peddlers of hate and violence should have been met with swift consequences and clear condemnation from political and community leaders. Too often they instead have heard indifference, equivocation, tacit approval, or worse. My colleagues and I have successfully sued to block many of the most egregious moves by this administration, relying on the courts to protect our citizens' rights from actions by the federal government. We've also worked to pick up the slack where we can, through programs or enforcement actions, though, the, though we work with more limited resources, jurisdiction, and authority than those available to federal agencies. Simply put, this is not the way it should be, and it is not a sustainable model for protecting citizens' rights. We need to, again, be able to rely on the federal government to be a partner in protecting the civil rights of our citizens rather than a threat to them. As the Commission continues its work, I would encourage you to be bold and be honest about the realities of civil rights in the United States and the sources of threats to those rights. It is clear to me, many of my constituents and of many of my colleagues that there is reason for alarm. A clear-eyed, impartial declaration of the threat to civil rights in America would be a courageous and necessary step that history will surely judge favorably. Thank you, and as the top law enforcement officer, officers of our states, my colleagues and I stand ready to assist you in any way possible. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, members of the commission. I'm Lakshmi Sridharan, and I serve as the Director of National Policy and Advocacy for South Asian Americans Leading Together, or SALT. We are a national, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that fights for racial justice and advocates for the civil rights of all South Asians. And our core policy priorities are in civil rights, immigration, and combating hate crimes. In our critical work, both documenting and addressing hate violence against our communities, we rely on the Department of Justice to enforce hate crimes protections at the federal level. During a time when hate violence against South South Asian, Muslim, Sikh, Hindu, Middle Eastern, and Arab American communities has risen nearly 45% in the last year alone. And I should note that our data found that one in five hate incidents we documented, we found that the perpetrator cited the president, his administration, or one of this administration's policies while committing the act of violence. So as you can understand, we are appalled that underreporting of hate crimes is occurring at a factor of over 40 to 1, according to the National Crime Victimization Survey. Even more unacceptable are ProPublica's recent findings that 120 federal agencies have not complied with mandates to submit hate crimes data to the FBI. In fact, ProPublica's investigation found that the FBI itself is not submitting hate crimes it investigates to its own database. The DOJ must make hate crimes by both local law enforcement and federal agencies mandatory with consequences for inaction to ensure that we all have the data to even understand the magnitude of this problem and then fully enforce and prosecute hate crimes. Additionally, we are deeply disturbed by the racist and anti-immigrant framework being advanced by this Department of Justice through its task force on crime reduction and public safety, defined as so-called illegal immigration, drug trafficking, and violent crime. A subcommittee within this task force focuses on hate crimes. This infrastructure advances the myth of immigrants as perpetrators of hate crimes, rather than focusing on the growing problem of white supremacist hate violence targeting all vulnerable communities. Lastly, on this point, prosecutions cannot be the only tool of enforcement to address hate crimes. This DOJ eliminated the budget of its community relations service. CRS was an arm of DOJ that supported the very difficult task of building trust between communities and law enforcement, which research and evidence strongly suggests is one of the most effective ways to improve hate crimes reporting. This DOJ has undermined a key tool for addressing and preventing hate crimes. On immigration, another one of our priority areas, we are aware and disturbed by the number of detainees and detention facilities across the country facing a number of, a number of civil rights violations. This includes withholding medical treatment, force feeding, abusive treatment, and retaliation by detention center staff, withholding critical language interpretation, and denial of bond hearings. The Office of uh, Civil Rights and Civil Liberties within DHS must have more power and resources. Um, DHS staff visited the Folkestone, Georgia a detention facility this year, a private detention center run by GEO Group in August, uh, after receiving several complaints, and yet we have not heard anything about this investigation. Due to the deference to ICE within DHS, we recommend an independent ombudsperson position to be created to liaison between communities and CRCL to move such complaints through a transparent process and ensure the civil rights of all detainees are enforced. Thank and you very much. And we'll be submitting a full written. Thank you. Yes. 
Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. My name is Catherine Bean, and I serve as Vice President for Public Policy and Advocacy at YWCA USA. Founded 160 years ago, YWCA is one of the oldest and largest women's organizations in the United States, and is dedicated to eliminating racism, empowering women, and promoting peace, justice, dignity, and freedom for all. Today, we serve over 2 million women, girls, and family members through a network of 210 local associations across 46 states and the District of Columbia. Across this vibrant network, we are proud to provide a broad range of services to meet the health, safety, economic security, racial justice, and civil rights needs of women, girls, and communities. And as our CEO, Alejandra Castillo, often says, while not every YWCA has a pool, we're here to help when women feel like they're drowning. At YWCA, we are profoundly concerned by the active and ongoing rollback of civil rights enforcement and attention to the needs of and experiences of marginalized communities across numerous federal agencies. Of particular note, YWCA is concerned by the rescission and changes to guidance by the Department of Education regarding sexual violence, campus sexual assault, and transgender students, and the potential rescission of guidance on school discipline. Changes to the Department of Health and Human Services draft strategic plan which eliminated re references to health disparities experienced by racial and ethnic minorities and LGBTQ people. The Department of Justice's rollback in the use of consent decrees, the Department of Housing and Urban Development's removal of anti-discrimination language from its mission statement, as well as HUD's suspension of the affirmatively furthering fair housing rule, and the denial of refuge and safety for survivors of domestic and sexual violence that is occurring daily at our borders, as well as the ongoing tragedy of children's separation from their parents. These and other recent actions, which you've heard detailed testimony about throughout the day, reinforce gender and racial stereotypes, exacerbate systemic barriers, and send a clear message that the federal government is not fulfilling its critical role of protecting and vindicating civil rights. And the true irony here is that these rollbacks are occurring at a time when women have heightened concerns about discrimination, safety, and economic security. YWCA's recent national report, What Women Want 2018, makes clear that women's experiences of gender discrimination remain prevalent and in fact have increased since 2012, and that Black, Latina, and Asian Pacific Islander women experience racial discrimination at even higher rates in addition to the gender, ex uh, gender discrimination that they experience. Moreover, many of women's top areas of concern relate to issues that are directly impacted by the lack of enforcement of civil rights. As is too often the case in our history, women, people of color, and other marginalized groups are directly impacted and bear the cascading impacts of the federal government's changed policies and practices with respect to civil rights enforcement. These are the very same people and communities that YWCA's serve. Thank you for the opportunity to share these comments. I um, anticipate and uh, will be thankful to be able to provide additional comments in writing in a few weeks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Faith Williams, and I'm the Senior Manager of Government Relations at the National Council of Jewish Women, known as NCJW. NCJW is a grassroots organization with members across the country devoted to improving the lives of women, children, and families, and safeguarding individual rights and freedoms. We're 125 years old this year. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. We will submit more de a more detailed statement for the record. There is no shortage of the ways the administration has rolled back and undermined civil rights. You've heard so many of them from our partners here today. Rather than reiterate that list, I want to focus on a broader push from this administration to make policies and interpret law based on a narrow interpretation of evangelical Christianity. NCJW supports comprehensive, accessible, and affordable health care for all, including access to abortion. We believe women have the right to make their own reproductive and childbearing decisions. We work for programs and policies that protect all people from discrimination and bias, regardless of their race, religion, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, immigration status, ability, and more. Uh, why do I list just some of our many principles? Because these beliefs are based on our Jewish values, not in spite of them. As Jews, we know that gender is a spectrum, a concept rooted in traditional Jewish texts. We are taught that protecting an existing life is of paramount importance. We believe in kavod habriot, respect and dignity for all people. 
B'Tselem Elohim, we are all made in the image of God, and Tzedek Tzedek Tirdof, the pursuit of justice always. When the administration makes policy to align with one interpretation of one religion, or when they allow employers, health plans, and business owners to use their religious beliefs to thwart our laws, it threatens the religious liberty of all people. We depend on religious liberty to be a protective shield, not a weapon to harm and demean others. Thank you for your time. Hi, my name is Monica Dor. Hi, and it's a great pleasure to get today to speak to you. For over the decade, I've worked at World Bank, and I got the chance to conduct training with the Equal Employment Commission to be an official enforcement enforcer for the Fairness Act. I work with the Controller General Davy Walker for over 15 years. However, my work is international and I'm not as much known here in Washington. However, I wanted to show a little bit the work that we've done at World Bank and international organizations and how do you play this uh, you apply the civil rights to international organizations because many of us are Americans working in those institutions. My job is, and my PhD was last year the most recommended, commended, and received more congratulatory letters from the United States Senate and Congress than any other PhD in the Union. <laughs> I receive a Medal of Honor, a celebration for a decade of research. My job is on anti-fraud, anti-corruption. I do not play and do not have a political career. I'm a, uh, just a professional. So please note, I do not play any political role in such, neither was appointed by President Barack Obama or Trump. I'm, I'm a career uh, professional. Mentioning so, uh, my research and my PhD research uh, was awarded in 2005 at Michigan State. And we speak today about civil rights. My PhD advisor was Brian Silver, and he worked after September 11, all the civil rights and how we're affected by September 11. However, my PhD advisor at the time uh, is the largest, the most known expert in dissidents of the Soviet Union that emigrated to the United States. Uh, Michigan State and University of Michigan hold the largest database what happened to Americans that emigrated from Eastern Europe. Why would you care? Uh, a decade later, we looked through the database, and I want the commission to understand this is research, it's not political, it was not intended as such, it's pure data. And we have here also um, an excerpt for you in the PhD dissertation. Melania Vats Trump is foreign born in the country of Slovenia. Melania Trump, you say, what's the link with civil rights? Uh, the link is. M you need to look at Melania Trump and what will happen through, uh, and this is our research in our book, to in fact, who is Melania Trump? Melania Trump grew up in a dictatorship and her parents were leaders in the Tito. Uh, um, we have to stop you Tito. there, but we'll be pleased to see the written submission. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And with that, that uh, closes this briefing. Uh, thank everybody for your participation. We will, as I mentioned, keep our record open uh, until December 17th. Uh, panelists and members of the public would like to submit materials for commission consideration, which we welcome. They mail them to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, Office of Civil Rights Evaluation. The address is 1331 Pennsylvania Avenue Northwest, Suite 1150, Washington, D.C., 20425, or email them to enforcement at usccr.gov. I ask that our attendees move any continuing conversations outside of the hearing room so our staff can complete the logistics necessary to close us out. And please make sure you exit the building through the F Street street lobby as the exit to the Pennsylvania Avenue side is closed. Thank you very much. That concludes this briefing.